Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Good to have uh, visitors with us. I know a lot of you are here with family in town, and so we're grateful to have you here with us. Just a few reports. The pie and praise uh, was wonderful. I heard just powerful testimonies, and one of the themes running through is deep suffering from many different angles with people beholding God and trusting Him and believing, and it was just so encouraging to see what God is doing in our midst, and that praise was just radiating from those who are suffering and finding God to be who He is. And then on a lesser note, the turkey bowl was an excellent day. Uh, Raise your hand if you're sore. (laughs) All right. It was was beautiful. Um, It was cold. It was cold, but it was still just the the fellowship was, was deep and sweet and just Saw little kids scoring touchdowns, and they'll talk about their turkey bowl touchdowns for years to come, so these things are big. Well, next week we begin Advent, where we prepare our hearts to get the fullness uh, from the incarnation, as we just sang that Emmanuel, that's an amazing name that God is with us, and I I pray that never ceases to take your breath away. Um, We're going to celebrate that. Romans 14 talks about different conscience issues and how we deal with them, and we have that with Christmas celebrations. So at the church, we focus on what we're all in agreement on, and that's that the reality of God being incarnated into this world and the Word became flesh and is worthy of our focus and our worship. So we will all do that together in the weeks ahead. So this morning, we'll continue our study in Romans. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 12. Uh, verses 3 through 8, just a beautiful section. We're going to be in it for three weeks. Um, I'm going to call it your Christmas present. So here you go. Uh, I think this could, could be very sanctifying for the, the body of Christ, if we could understand this and behold these truths. It's, it's done so much in my own heart, and it, it's filled me with a deeper love for the brethren and wanting to do whatever I can for my gifts to help you become more like Christ and to receive your gifts to help me become more like Christ. And so that is the beauty and the desire of my heart. So let's read Romans 12, 3 through 8, and then we will go to God and pray and ask his blessing. I did find out we were supposed to have two baptisms and they got canceled at the last second, so I have a lot more time to preach. So I just want you to get comfortable and enjoy the ride. Verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, Each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for these words, and I pray now as you have said, that our minds can be renewed through the Word of God, I ask that you would do that in our midst in the weeks ahead, that you would cause us to think your thoughts about the body of Christ, that we would understand our roles and how you have designed this to function. God, take out worldliness. Don't let us be conformed to the world in the way we think about the body of Christ. Do not let us bring the world into this body and its thinking and its assessments and its worthies and just just please let this be otherworldly as we gather in here and I pray that you lead and guide us now to think your thoughts about the body of Christ and it's in that precious name of Jesus that we do pray amen so Romans 12 1 through 2 we've spent five weeks on um, the key therefore Again, guys, what we are going to look at now in the body of Christ, I don't want you to run to your own strength, your own power. I want you to flow into the gospel, believe it, 
live into it, and just be overcome with the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. And as you look at that, just, I want to give my body to you, God. I want you to take my life. I want to serve you. It's yours now. And I, I can't let the world shape my thinking and be conformed to it. I need to be metamorphosed. I need to be renewed, a, a new creation, changing, metamorphosed into the image of Christ through the Word of God so that I can know the will of God, so I can live what pleases God. And now we're going to shift and say, what is the will of God? How, does it, how do I please Him in this area in the church? And so Romans 12, 1 through 2 is our foundation stone for us to live faithfully to God. And now this morning, Paul is going to move into to the areas that we need to renew our minds and be changed in our thinking. And I can't think of an area that needs more changing in how you think than the body of Christ, because the world has made us think wrong, and we move in here, and we need God to renew our minds in this area. What is the will of God for the body of Christ? So where will Paul begin? Where is he going to move now as he begins application? And he starts with our unity. These called out ones. And the first place that Paul begins in most of his letters, whenever he moves into sanctification, is this. And he says, we need to renew our minds to see the importance of the body and how we're to think about it and how we're to serve it and how we're to love it. We need to think his thoughts. And God has, made this, uh, God has made this the place. Ephesians, he said, where the manifold wisdom of God is put on display. And so if we get what he's talking about, the world will look at this church and say, that is the manifold wisdom of God, how he's united people from all different walks of life. And now they dwell in unity and, and people are going to marvel at the gospel. And so God has designed the church to be the theater where his glory is put on display. And so it, it matters that all of us renew our minds and get this. So we saw that the power of the world is going to try to conform us into thinking like it. But we have a greater power. We've been given the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, and we've been given the inspired word of God to renew our minds, to be metamorphosed, to be changed. And we have something else we have the body of Christ to help us in this transformation. This body is, is to help. And truly, God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And I know there are many of you sitting here saying this, wait, <laughs> I love the Holy Spirit. I love his word. It's my meditation every day. But his body has hurt me more than the Word of God and the Holy Spirit ever could or would. It, it hasn't helped me grow. It's actually hindered my growth. It has brought more pain to me than any area of my life. I've heard this maybe hundreds of times. Uh, I, I think I've said it once. But I, I think all of these rubs and hurts and disappointments and being sinned against in a body are the way that God grows us and sanctifies us. He actually is going to use that piece in our sanctification. And it's why um, he, he's going to call that we, we, I'll talk about in a second, but there needs to be humility and forgiveness and forbearance to keep the unity of the Spirit in Ephesians. And so right away, you, you realize that as we're put in a body, and we're, it's not heaven yet. So you still have remaining sin. And you know what that means? Some of you are gnarly dudes. Some of you are going to sin against each other, hurt each other. That God is not taken by surprise by that. That is part of his design. And so we're trying to grow and mature and become more like Jesus, but it's everything from A to Z, and he sticks them in a body and says, unity, love one another. And so I want you to see that that's part of our growth. God didn't make a mistake. We grow by each other's gifts and graces and love and we grow by each other's weaknesses and sins and slanders and rejections. All of these things God's going to be weaving together, growing us up into our head. To stick a bunch of believers with remaining sin, the world and the devil, into a body and say live in unity seems crazy. But it's the incubator called the church of God 
that I have watched grow and mature. They grow up into the head. Show of hands for how God has grown you by enduring hurt in the body of Christ in your life. Seriously. Show of hands for how many have hurt someone in the body of Christ intentionally or unintentionally. <laughs> okay, it's the right group that we're talking to. We are looking for heaven in the body of Christ, and it will be a disfigured thing until Christ comes back and perfects his bride. But it is God's wisdom and plan for his glory to go forth and for our growth. And we need to see that. And so I just need you to start thinking his thoughts to renew your mind. There's going to be sin in the body of Christ that will hurt me. And I don't go to the next church saying, I got to find one that doesn't hurt me. Because until glory, there's always someone who will hurt us. It will happen. But how we deal with that and how we work through it and how we grow is going to be what God is after in this section and in all the teaching on the church. So this morning, we're going to begin to look at our life together and look at what needs to be addressed in our community, Southside, to work the way that God desires for it to work. Where Ephesians says the body causes the growth of the body. And that's always been my prayer is that if we get what Paul's saying, all of our gifts working together will cause us to grow and become more like Jesus Christ. And that, that is what I desire and have been praying and seeking. And I don't think I've ever seen it happening more than since I've been a pastor. So this isn't to just beat you. <laughs> it's, you're doing good, but let's excel still more. There's a lot where we can grow. And I have grown so much in my own heart just in these three weeks. And I hope the same will happen for you. So no one is exempt except unbelievers. So if you've come here and you are not a Christian, um, you don't have to use your gift for the body of Christ because you don't have one until you're saved. So my desire is that you don't try to get into a church and serve and do things, but that you would believe in Jesus Christ, came and died on a cross for your sins and lived a perfect life so you could be in the presence of a perfect God. And so I, I would ask you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And then for those who are believers, every one of you are going to be addressed in this passage. So how does the new mind think as we start application? Look with me in verse 3. First thing, 4, through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment <coughs> as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And so in this one verse is all we're going to look at this morning. There are four words in the Greek that are mind words. And the four uh, is connecting us to verse two, the renewing of your mind. So there's our connection. You need to renew your minds to the will of God. Here's the will of God. I'm going to start showing you how to think the right thoughts about the body of Christ. And the first thing he goes after is that. He starts with the greatest cancer to the body of Christ and us having unity. What is that? So that we can grow and use our gifts and build each other up into the head. What do you think is the greatest cancer to that happening? And Paul hits it right out of the gate. Pride. Pride is the greatest danger to this body. It's just going to break down the whole design and everything that God wants. So I remember when Peter was talking about cancer, and I wish I could just call you up here and explain cancer as a medical doctor. I, I just know that cells start going against each other. They attack, and these cells start hurting good cells until it could damage and kill a whole body. And one little cancer cell of pride can do that in the body of Christ. So how you think about yourself and the body of Christ is the first thing that Paul addresses. What is your mindset about you? And this is big because pride has been the reigning sin since the fall of Adam. And even before with Lucifer, Satan wanting to be like God. It's the reigning sin. And it's a, it's a destroying sin. Pride is cancer to the body of Christ. And, and to you, using your body to offer it up as a living sacrifice and serving God and others, you want, you want to just 
cut that at the knees? Pride. Pride will wipe that desire out. It's a big old counterfeit in serving the body of Christ. It's pride, and you come in, and it's still about you. It's, it's you. you. You want to put your name out there. It's, it's, you want people to notice you. It's still pride. Walk here on Sundays and just say, who's going to notice me? Is anyone going to see that I made their coffee? I held their door. I just want people to see and notice me. That's cancer. That is death to the body of Christ. Look at me. You're just going to see that is, that is opposite of everything that Paul is about to teach us. And so I just want to begin. The first thing to address in your heart with the new mind is, what do I think of myself as I walk into the body of Christ? It's a big question. Because some of you have never walked into a church without just saying, this is about me. And that, that needs to stop by the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. There's something bigger and better than you. It's about this beautiful Lord Jesus Christ. And we have gifts to put that on display and to build people up into it. And we will see that as we go. But I want you to see this beautiful bridge. This is better than Coronado Bridge. You got Romans 12, 1 through 2 that we've looked at for five weeks. I'll stop. And then verses 4 through 8, he, he brings a body metaphor, the physical body. And he's going to connect them. And, and this is the way Paul views the body of Christ. And he says, all these members in our bodies are to work together for the building up of itself in love. One of the things I'm enjoying, enjoying as a parent, I never got to slow down to think. But with my grandkids, I'm, I'm just watching how they learn and grow and this body is all working together and one day they're going to grow up and be adults. And so it's just cool how you have all these little members and as they work together, you grow up and you mature. And that's the picture that Paul's using here. And there's just this vital connection of the organic union in Christ and, and the vital need of each other. So every part of the body needs the other parts. And so he, he wants us to get that vision that Every part is working together and every part matters if we're going to grow. And that, that's where Paul's taking it. So I want you to see that, that when you think of consecration to God, when, when, if I had you write down the top 10 things when you think of being holy, what they are, this one never makes the list. And it's Paul's first one. And so holiness is not isolation. I just got to get away from everybody and get with my Bible and I'm going to be holy. And all of a sudden, Paul's starting with holiness begins in jumping in to the body of Christ, not in pulling away from it. A life set apart for God is not set apart from people. It gauges them. What's the fulfillment of the whole law? To love God and to love others. And Romans 1 through 11 is I love God. And the fruit now is I love others. And so if I'm renewing my mind, I have a whole new view of others and I'm entering in for their good to love them and grow them and bless them. I'm, I'm a new creation. I think differently before. All I could think of is how can I use other people? How can I use you, get what I want, approve me, like me? All, all I could do was use you. And the gospel comes in and now all I want to do is help you, bless you, grow you, and help you. You want holiness? starts here. We're to serve each other in the body of Christ. And this is where our newness is to be worked out. This is where we grow. You want holiness without this, you're just going to get a list of rules and you'll miss the gospel. It's, it's what the Pharisees did. They just took it to the rules and the externals and they missed this love of the whole law. So if consecrated to God, the first place you will manifest it is in the beloved of God. That's where it will begin. My life, my worship, my offering to you, God, is to be worked out in the new community. That's what this does. And this is the faith in Romans 1-11 through of the gospel working through love, as Paul said in Galatians. This is the obedience of faith. This is the spillover of the life of faith is love and mercy toward others. It's just the fruit of what comes out of faith. Just go to the book of Acts. What characterized the early church was their life together 
their fellowship together. It says they were sharing house to house, hospitality. They met together. They broke bread together. <clears throat> there was this mutual fellowship in Acts 2.44. All those who had believed were together, and they had all things in common, koinonia. They, they just had this oneness in Christ and his kingdom and love. They just, it was beautiful. It was a body that had koinonia. We, we just share everything in Christ, and nothing I have is not for your good. In fact, to be outside the church was what? Excommunication. <laughs> you didn't want that. Now people do it to themselves every day. You excommunicate yourself from the church. And so it's, we don't excommunicate. It was a dreadful thing. Side note, fight then for those who, who ever pull away from it. Jesus said he left the 99 to go after the one. And I, and I want you to notice when people are gone or struggling or hurt, where we, we go after them and we, we keep bringing them to the place where they, they, they thrive in God's design. So this, my friends, is a call to engage the body of Christ. I, one of the worst statements is, I go to church. <laughs> you don't. Church is not a building. It's called out ones who have been joined to Jesus Christ. That's the church. And that is what makes assembling incredible is that you have been joined to Jesus Christ. This is the church. And there's a major problem here then that Paul wants to address. And I think this is why many don't engage. is pride. Either pride has hurt you or your pride moves you out of it. And pride then is this enemy to this beautiful design. And I hate to tell you this, I'm going to go after it this morning. So... If pride is not dealt with, we will not make beautiful music together. It'll, it'll ruin it. It'll be that gonging, resounding gong and clanging cymbal. We don't have love. We will not build each other up. We'll actually gather and tear each other down. We'll hurt one another deeply, and the whole body metaphor just falls apart. Pride is so destructive to the body of Christ. And so Paul is going to first address how we think about ourselves, what mindset, what renewing must take place in the body of Christ for me to be changed and transformed. And to think, what is the key to the body causing the growth of the body? Humility. Humility is the key. It's a sweet aroma filling the body of Christ. And the whole gospel should produce humility. And I just see it all over scripture. Ephesians, the, the gospel, what we have in Christ and Body life starts with that, and I want you just to hear it. Paul's first application in Ephesians is this. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, what's that, Paul? I want to walk worthy. I, I want to I work on my, my language. I want to work on my wrong thoughts. Get, I, I want to change. What is it? Well, with all humility and gentleness... And patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It's this call to keep the unity that he's purchased and bought from the whole book of Ephesians and the gospel. And it's going to come with humility, forbearance, gentleness, patience. That says the body of Christ will be difficult at times. And the way we're going to put this on display is his glory is bigger than my hurt. It has to be. And that's the first way to renew our minds and think about the body of Christ. Pride is destructive. The me life is harmful to the church. And it's so sad because it's the culture that we live in. And Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. And we walk into the church and we think like the world, and we approve people like the world does, and we disapprove people like the world does, and, and we think the world's thoughts in here, and when we walk through those doors, I want you to know it dies. Don't come in here thinking like the world. Come in here renewing your mind and thinking the will of God for each other. It's, it's just, it's the air we breathe, this pride. I remember the whole church growth mov movement. You can have it your way. Come into church. What do you want in a church? We'll give it to you. 
and it killed us because everything became about our felt needs. And we look down and say, oh, I disagree with that movement. And we walk into our churches and we still want it to be about us. That's just broken, pride, wrong. You don't just walk in saying, it's all about me. This is all about Jesus putting on his glory and his display with all of us taking our role and our peace. There's just something better than you. I praise God it's not about me. You guys would hate it. You get it, it gets to be about Jesus. It's about wanting to advance yourself, to show your great knowledge and your special enlightenment and you're, you're, you're holier than anyone who's ever walked and to show, you know, it's all about your needs. I, I can just say this. If it's about you, everything we look at in Romans 12 is going to expose you. And I pray that if that's what needs to happen, may the Spirit of God show you. The only fruit in your life is that you speak the truth. And the realities of Romans 12 are lacking. And you can't rejoice with those who rejoice, and you can't weep with those who weep. Your love has hypocrisy through and through. I can do nothing apart from him. It's been painful at times. It's been painful at times, but you learn in painful times. And you don't learn these deep truths of humility and prosperity. So all these trials are to be growing us in this body. And we all have to deal with this. This is not, listen to what it says in Romans 12, 3. He says, I say this to every man among you. And women, you do not get out from this. This is, this is just a phraseology. Everyone among you is to listen up. And it could be that we as men have a big problem with it. Yeah, I'm afraid that could be what he's after. But everyone among you, this is for you this morning. Is it still about you? Is this about magnifying the beauties and excellencies of Jesus Christ or your gifts? Are we humbly loving one another and using our gifts to build one another up? Do we view the body of Christ rightly? And so I'm fired up about this. You know why? One of the best days of my life was in Wheat Ridge, Colorado in 1989. I was standing up front here with a minister and the, and the piano began and she appeared. <laughs> and she walked down and she met me at the front. And we stood and we became a, a, a married couple. And so what I'm entitling Romans 12 is a bride that any bridegroom would love. And I, I just want us to be a beautiful bride for Jesus. Romans 12 is the adornment of his bride. This is what Christ wants for his bride. This is what faith produces. And so let's adorn ourselves for the bridegroom, not by exercising and makeup and flowers, but by this. Paul's going to show us that for us to be beautiful, individually and corporately, we're all dependent on one another. And if you don't use your gifts for the body of Christ, it will not be the full manifestation of him to the world. And if we all hold them back, we're going to look like a bag lady rather than an adorned bride. And so I, I want us to be this bride for Jesus Christ. So let's begin. That's my introduction. <laughs> Romans 12, 3, we're going to call it a presupposition. So we begin now. There, there is necessary presupposition that we must have before we jump into spiritual gifts. And if I had to summarize what it is, it's a humble recognition of our reception of the gift of God that he gave to us. And so it's crucial that we can never properly esteem others within this fellowship if our pride is in the way. Pride is the destroyer of right relationships and right service. It will always break those things. And so four is the result again of what he said. He says, through the grace given to me. And Paul starts, I'm an apostle. I have the gift of teaching, preaching. And as he begins, he just says, everything I have is all of grace. Just the humility oozing out of the apostle Paul. I'm an apostle. And as I speak this to you, it's all of the grace of God that's flowing through me. I'm a debtor to grace as well as you are. I say this is, is not my own strength, my own smarts. I'm an apostle because of grace. 
I tried to kill people that named Jesus. I, I, I was the worst person there ever was. I was the poster child for lost. I'm an apostle because of grace, and I serve in the gifts. by the grace of God, for the good of the church, for the rest of history. So it's grace that's flowing through me. Not, I figured this all out. Oh, God is flowing. He's used it's his grace that this is happening. Write down 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 10. And 1 Corinthians 15, 9. I'm, I'm going to go forever, so I, instead of looking up all these verses, I'll just do one. <laughs> Ephesians 3, 7. Paul says, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. It's all of grace. It's all of his doing. He gave me this. He, he's doing it through me. He had such a good understanding of what he's saying. So what a way to begin this exhortation. I say this as one who received grace. I come as a recipient of grace to exhort you to be humble. Everything that you have, church of God, is from grace. There's nothing you have that you earned or deserved. It just start. it's from grace. How does that produce pride? Nothing in you. It's all from God's goodness and his grace. I say to every man among you, it's very personal, the application to every soul in this body. What is it that you want to say to us, Paul? You got our attention. We're riveted. In the literal Greek, it says this, not to think too highly of yourself beyond what you ought to think, but to think so as to think soberly is the exhortation. There's a way of thinking that Paul is concerned about here. We need to renew our minds, our thinking, and there's something that you need to renew it in. Our minds can approve the will of God. Well, here's what it should think. And it starts with the negative. And it's, it's interesting that the four words in this section all are the word think. They all have the root word. Some of you are studying Greek. Phronane is, is the, the word for think. It means mind, mind function, or mind orientation. And Paul uses it four times. It means to think, to give one's mind to, to aim your mind faculties toward this. And so uh, Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on the things above. And so the first one is hooper phronain, hooper. It's a little preposition on the front of phronain. And, and hooper is where we get the word hyper. And so what does it mean to hyperextend something? It's to extend too far. I, I think I did it in the turkey bowl. Um, to go beyond, to, to go over. And here, it's, it's thinking beyond the way you should be thinking. It's going too far. Don't have a mindset beyond what it should be about yourself. You're going beyond how you think about yourself. Don't be high-minded. Don't estimate yourself beyond what you should estimate yourself to be. Apart from him, I can do nothing. That's nothing. Temptation to overvalue ourselves. That's how we come from the world. We think too much about ourselves. Even a low self-image is I think too much about myself. I think about me. That's the battle. And he says, quit overthinking about yourself. I, Paul is so balanced because in this statement, he deals with another mistake. Don't think too lowly of yourselves. And that's what I mean by this is a false humility to say, I don't have any gifts. Mine aren't really important. The church would be fine without me. I want you to hear this. He wants us to renew our minds in that because it, it can be hard. And I get you've journeyed hard waters. And it's easy to sit and preach that to yourself, but it's not true. That's actually overthinking yourself by underthinking, because God says, I gave you a gift, and you're to exercise it, and for you to say, no, my in the temple of God, and you matter. I, I like the saying, there's no spiritual appendix 
in the church of God. I always love when they take out your appendix and say it's not a necessary organ. You know, okay, there's no appendixes in the church of God. There's no not necessary organ. Every part matters in the church of God. And Paul is saying, don't think too highly about yourself. And there's this Greek contrast. It's the strongest word is Allah, but rather have sophronine. Rather have sophronine. This is a call then, instead of overthinking yourself, think rightly about yourself. It's not to say, just say you're a nobody. It's to think rightly about yourself. And it means to be of sound mind, reasonable, moderation, really to keep one's head about them, is this word. It's used in Mark 5.15 of the demoniac, where he came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed in his, here's the Greek word, clothed in his right mind. And the right mind, instead of gashing himself, is now sitting at the feet of Jesus worshiping. That's to think rightly about Christ in himself. It's used of a qualification of an elder. This word is used when it says older men teach younger men and older women teach younger women to have this right way of thinking about yourself, sober understanding. And so we're to have a real appraisal of what we are what gifts God has given to us, why he's given them to us, and that they're all of grace, no more, no less. Get that. And so you need to think rightly and soberly about how God has gifted you, how he's equipped you. Paul's saying, render a right reckoning of what you really are in the body of Christ and have humility about it. God has equipped me and it is all of grace. What is there to boast about? Paul said this, for who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you didn't receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? What are you boasting about? Everything in the Christian life is from grace. How do we over hyperextend our thinking about ourself when what grace showed me was who I was? I could bring nothing to God. And now how do I start hyper-thinking Ken Murphy? Hyper. And now I want you to see how God's going to deal with that this morning. Because I, I want it to die in me and in you. And the way he does it, he says, because God has allotted to each a measure of faith. That's, is that said lit for you? Let's go home. I'm like, how, how does that fix my pride problem? <laughs> this connection has stumped me for years, and by the grace of God, he broke it open this week. What is the connection with humility, thinking rightly about yourself and the body of Christ, is that God has allotted to each a measure of faith. I had a pastor and scholar who just set me free in this this week. And he had four answers, and I I wholeheartedly agree with them, and they're all in the text. So I want you to work through this with me. First, Paul shows that the essential newness of our renewed mind is faith. So what has made you new is that you now have eyes to see. You have faith, and you get the gospel. You see the glory of Jesus and and how beautiful he is and what he's done. You have faith. You get it. We've seen Christ, uh, that veil. It says you saw no value in him and it's been removed and now you see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I have faith. I see, I see Jesus. I see what he's done. I love him. I treasure him. Our faith then is the essence of our new mind. And, And our new mind now has faith in Jesus Christ to think rightly about him and ourselves. It it can appraise Jesus for who he is and what he's done. I used to, that meant nothing to me, the cross. And now it's, I, it's everything. I've resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. So this new mind is connected to faith. And that is what is new about it. That we have faith in Jesus Christ. And so if we look at faith, in a nutshell, Paul said it's to put no confidence in the flesh, but to boast only in Jesus Christ. And so I'm done 
thinking that I could do anything to earn God's merit or favor. I, I can't boast in anything in me, but I boast in Jesus now as he's everything. That's, that's, you want to know if you got faith this morning? That's a nutshell of what it is. It looks away from anything in you. You, you died to hope in you. You tried to clean yourself up and you got worse. And you look away now to Jesus Christ as your remedy. You love him, you receive him, you call upon him, you believe upon him, and you trust him. Faith is totally dependent on another. 100%. Jesus. Faith's movement then is what? It moves away from me. My faith before I was saved was in me. And I I died. And it moves away from anything in me. And it moves to Jesus alone. It lands on Christ. And and you know what it is? Satisfied. I'm satisfied in Christ. Who he is, what he's done. He's enough. And so the new mind, it sees and it appraises Jesus. His majesty, his work, his beauty. So what, what, what happens is, is ourselves are not the highest treasure anymore in life. So you don't walk in here, I'm so great. Because faith is done with believing or thinking that. Ourself isn't the best. I look away now to Christ and all that he is. And we embrace him and not ourselves. And that's the unity of this body is that we walk in and you're done with self and you see self for what it is. And we all look to Jesus and we believe and we have that. That's what unites us here this morning. It's beautiful. And so Paul is looking at a people all puffed up and says, don't think too highly of yourselves, but make a measure of yourself by your faith. And the essence of your faith now is that it looks only to Jesus. This is taking self-exaltation and turning it on its head. It's all about Christ. And that's what's happened in every one of us that have faith. So we don't walk in here going, look at me. I moved away from that to look at him. If you want this to be about you, and you want to exalt yourself, you want to put yourself on display, you want to do all these things for God, you just want to be noticed, you miss the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith is a joy and a preoccupation in Christ that gets self out of the picture. You want significance this morning? Embrace the significant one. You want value? Embrace the pearl of great price. You want esteem? Embrace the one who's worthy of all esteem. How you value Christ is your value. And I want you to go meditate on that for at least a week. How you value Jesus is your value. My faith. Faith is the measure of who I am. Faith and pride and high thinking can't go together. What that has done to my pride and selfish thinking in this body of Christ has done wonders. This is good. It's not, don't think less of yourself. Think less about yourself and more about Jesus. I love that hymn, more about Jesus. More, more, more about Jesus. It's just all about him. That's what faith is. I pray you have that. Secondly, faith is a gift from God. It it eliminates all boasting. It says God has allotted. So just right away, you didn't create your faith. I just can't do this. Good job, Ken. You, You created faith. You believed. And we've been looking at it in Romans 9 through 11. God gave faith. It's a gift. He spoke it into being. He opened your eyes and you responded with faith. And so it's a gift. You didn't muster it up. God gave it. And he wants you just to start there. God's allotted it. God's granted it. You didn't create it. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. 
It's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. We should be the most humble, grateful people if we have faith. And we walk around saying everything is a gift from God. Every heartbeat is a gift. I don't deserve the cross. Everything is a gift. How does that make you proud? Whatever I am this morning is a gift of God by grace. Faith is to leave us humble, looking to Him alone. Thirdly, God assigns faith differently and in different proportions and thus produces a humble inter interdependence and a servanthood, and that one needs a little explanation. So start with there are differing degrees of faith. If you've never heard that before, work with me because it's important to being humble, okay? So God has allotted, the Greek word means to distribute or to give. So God's distributed or given to everybody a varying proportion of faith. He, he, I, I want to show you this from Scripture. 2 Thessalonians 1.3. <clears throat> we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. Your faith is growing. It's been enlarged. Romans 14.1, except the one who is weak in faith. But, so there's some who are weaker in faith, and some who are stronger in faith. There's just differing levels of faith every Sunday, and sometimes it switches every Sunday to who it is and who it isn't. But there's just, God's given a grant of faith, how much it's grown. There's differences and variances throughout this whole body. And so we experience faith in differing degrees. Uh, there are 400 degrees here this morning. And we know this experientially. Anyone who's lived in the body of Christ, you know there's different levels of faith by interacting and who you talk with and where they're at, how they view their trials, their life. We're all at different places. Got it? So we don't judge and look down on people who are different levels of faith. I just want you to catch that. And so sitting here this morning, some of you are resting in God more than others. There's highs and lows, it's obvious. But faith sees a glory in Christ. The heart is drawn out to him to rest in him and enjoy him. And that goes up and down. There's very... And so the differing degrees of faith, I want you to catch this. It's God's doing. So all these differences, it's not you. It, listen to what it says. God is allotted. So God is allotted. He has given you the gift of faith. Um, he's the author and part perfecter of your faith, and he's allotted to each of you a portion in the way you're going to exercise it uh, in the body of Christ. And so he broke into your dead heart. He drew you to a living faith. He keeps you hour by hour, and he's the grantor of faith. And so my question is, why did God ordain it this way? And some questions you can't get answers for, but I think this one we can. Because here's my question to you. Doesn't that just produce pride? Some of you got more faith than others. <laughs> Look at me, I got more faith than you. How does that solve pride? It just doesn't seem like an answer that fixes it. Okay, think humble about yourself. Some of you have more faith than others. And that should make humility in the body of Christ. You're like, that doesn't bring humility. Well, let's look at it. Romans 15, 5. Paul says, now may the God who gives you to be of the same mind, here's our word, with one another, according to Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to live in harmony together with one voice that gives God glory. That's the close of Romans. And it seems to me that the more difficult it is to bring harmony in this motley crew um, is with all your diversity of faith, all your different gifts, your different backgrounds, your different races, your different trials and upbringings, your different conscience issues. Try unifying that. How does the world do it? 
You all need to think the same and dress the same and be the same. And, and so the only way the, uni- the world can ever get unity is if everybody's the same. And all of a sudden, God's saying, I have variance and difference in my body. And when it all works together in unity, you know what it does? It puts God on display even more that he can bring this group together with one voice and one accord to glorify him. The sweeter the voice that glorifies God, the Christ that unifies us is faith. And so that's what's at stake here. I want you to see it is bigger than you, what you feel about yourself and the hurt that you suffered. You've got to get over there's something bigger. And this way is interdependence and service. This would not be achieved if we all had cookie cutter faith. It just wouldn't work because we're going to see, he's going to say, you who can admonish, admonish. You who can encourage, encourage. Uh, you who have patience, have pati- help strengthen the knees that are weak. A- every gift you're going to see in a few weeks is a stronger faith moving to a weaker faith. And, and so how, how, how are you ever going to find unity if everybody's the same? And so there's this beautiful interdependence on each other and each other's gifts by making us all so varied. It just couldn't exist if there wasn't idle people, faint-hearted people, weak believers. It needs everything for all the gifts to function and work and love one another and build each other up. It's brilliant. I mean, it's just God's wisdom is perfect. For the, what, what an answer. I would have never thought of this in a million years for humility. 400 degrees of faith, varies from week to week. You come into this place. We have faith in Jesus Christ. We're humble with one another because no matter where I am at this morning, it's of God. Rising faith, sinking faith. You come in here. We had this sweet lady in our group just say, I got sinking faith this morning and everybody loved her, got encouraged. They said, she said what I wanted to say. And it was just unbelievable what God did. And all I could think about was Romans 12, 3. We're broken down and we're weary and you say, will you pray for me? I don't look down. It's all from God. God used this gift. I, I, it's nothing of me. It's been given to pray for this hurting saint this morning. I'm really battling sin right now. I feel so weak in faith. See, we, we don't look down on that. You can never look down on that if this is all of grace. God has allotted to each a measure of faith and it will change. And that is such a beautiful design. We just need each other to have this body build each other up and look like Jesus Christ. We need each other. I'm weak in suffering. I I run from suffering like a, maybe a cat running from a dog. What a great illustration. That's all that came to me. Sorry, guys. I run from it. And I need, I got these saints in here that have just walked in it and they endure it. And they say, I'm afraid of coming out of this trial because I know God so deeply. I need your faith. I need you to help me and encourage me. I'm despairing this morning. You who have stronger faith, will you help me? And no one looks down on anyone because it's all from him. And it's just love and mutuality and building each other up. And you can actually be real. I feel bitter. I just need to weep this morning. Will someone just weep with me instead of telling me Christians don't weep? This should open us up in our vulnerability when you get this. Pride is I got it all together. And I can tell you something, I don't even know every detail of your life, but you don't. It's called heaven. Because it's all of grace and ups and downs and my weaknesses. I need your help and my strengths. I want to give to help you. And it's all from God. There's no boasting, beating your chest or looking down. How do you look down on someone if it's all of grace? It doesn't even make sense. Get over yourself. Get grace. Get that you do have a measure of faith that moves away from yourself and looks to Jesus Christ to give it to one another. 
and to receive from one another. And when Paul says, let your love be without hypocrisy, it will never happen with pride. Pride is again the enemy of true love. Let sovereign grace humble you this morning that God mercy you. There's not many wise, mighty, or noble. I don't know why he chose me. I would never have. Renew your mind. Guys, renew your minds and get this. We need each other. I have a gift allotted by God to be exercised by faith. All for the glory of God. It's to be exercised by faith. Nothing in me, no confidence, looking to him and using that gift for the good of the body. Faith in Christ, who didn't consider himself a quality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. That's who I follow. That's who I believe in. I, f- I follow in those footsteps. Come back to what the body of Christ is about. What is the will of God for the body of Christ? Humility as we serve one another and the gifts that were given to us by his grace to exercise them for his glory. To enter into a broken mess, being metamorphosed and changed by all of our gifts from God through grace to build each other up into our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are interdependent on one another. Get over yourself and give to others for their good and God's glory. That's why you exist. What do you have that you did not receive? Why might you have more faith than someone else? Because God. Why do you look down on someone with weaker faith? It's not because you're smarter, better, wiser, more holy. It's because of God. It's humbling. This faith is not to nitpick and put others down and others who don't have all the great faith that you have, but it's faith to serve the body of Christ in love and to give yourself to the one who gave himself for you. And that is seen by giving yourself to this motley group assembled here this morning. And so to God be the glory for what he's done in the church. And this just gets better and better what he keeps unfolding in this passage. But that's where I just wanted to start this morning is faith and pride that just can't go together. And so we walk into this body with faith and we know that it's all of him and he gave me a gift that I didn't deserve and he wants to flow through me as his instrument, all to his glory, to use this gift to help the body of Christ. And, and, and hypocrisy and pride fakes it. And it fakes, every one of these gifts can be faked. But the one that flows from faith will be used of God to build up and edify the body. And so I pray that you treasure this and the humility that God is the one who gives the measure of faith to each one of us. And it's been allotted for the good of this body. No gift is for you. They're for the body. So there's no boasting. And we're humble with one another and we're honest because we're all struggling and battling with remaining sin and faith that goes up and down. And we just need each other. We got to be open and real and, and we got to help each other when we're hurting with our gifts. And I pray as we journey this, we'll see the beauty of how that's done. So let me pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful, beautiful passage. And I pray that you'll work in each one of our hearts, that the truth that Paul wrote that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so God, it's your mind and your heart to renew our minds, that we would think this way about the body of Christ, that we would think this way about ourselves and the body of Christ. How many sit here wounded because the body of Christ hasn't appreciated them the way that they should or saw how great their gift was. God, just the humility of sitting here broken with gifts to use for one another to be built up in the head, the Lord Jesus Christ, by truthing and love. God, help us. Heal us from a million different hurts from the world. Renew our minds and change our thinking together. Let us be patient and gentle and humble and forbearing with each other 
as we journey and keep this unity of the Spirit so that we might heal one another and be conformed to Christ and put your glory on display that you put difference in a body and it brought unity. Oh God, be glorified by the beautiful unity that you've created here this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.